in the UK, all medical staff have an oath where they vow to do no harm to their patients. But nurse Beverly Allett betrayed that oath in the most diabolical of ways, making her one of the most notorious serial killers in British history. <laughs> So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about Nurse Beverly Allett, aka the Angel of Death. This case is going to be a two-parter. This is part one. Part two will be out in the next few days. So make sure you subscribe to my channel. Make sure you got notifications on so that you don't miss when that one goes live. But quickly, before we get into part one of this case, I do just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Magellan TV. If you've been following me for a while, you already know how much I love Magellan TV. It is my favorite documentary streaming service, primarily because their true crime section is just so unique. Like no other streaming service does it like Magellan TV. I always recommend them to all my true crime fan friends. They just have so many like smaller cases on there from like all around the world. And they're all cases that I don't think I would have come across if it wasn't for Magellan TV. But ironically enough, my most recent watch was a UK documentary. Honestly, UK documentaries are my favorite. As much as I love hearing about ones all over the world, I just think the UK make solid true crime documentaries. It's one of the new releases on Magellan TV, it's called Double Murder, The Inside Story. And it's about these two Polish brothers that were murdered in their own apartment and their bodies just laid there for two days undiscovered. No one knew that they were murdered. One of the main reasons I loved this particular documentary was because they have so much like archive footage, like so much footage of the actual investigation. Like there's a video of the killer being arrested at work. Like you don't actually see that often. Yeah, I really recommend that documentary, 10 out of 10. Everyone go watch Double Murder, The Inside Story. Magellan TV is completely ad free. So you'll never be interrupted while you're watching your documentaries. You can watch on pretty much any device that you have. And they add between 15 and 20 hours of content every single week. So you're never gonna get bored. So if you do wanna try Magellan TV, they are very kindly offering you guys a one month free trial when you sign up using the link down below in the description. Thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. There are a lot of content warnings for this case so I'm just going to list them all off now, listen closely and if any of them are topics that you don't want to listen to right now, I completely understand, click out of the video here. Throughout this case there's going to be a lot of discussion of mental illnesses and things relating to that including in personality disorders, self-harm, anorexia, Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy. There's also brief mentions of animal abuse, domestic violence and rape. So if any of the above are things that you don't want to hear about, like I said, click out now. Hopefully I'll get to catch you a different time with a different case, but look after yourself. All that being said, let's just get into part one of the angel of death. So today's case begins in Grantham in Lincolnshire, which is in the East Midlands of England. And that is where Beverly Gail Allett was born on October 4th, 1968. She was the second of four children in her family and she very much had middle child syndrome. You know how they say that the middle child never really gets enough attention from their parents? Whether that's intentional or not, it just kind of like seems to happen. And she always craved a closer relationship with her parents all the way through her childhood. And I mean, it's not like she was being neglected. I really don't think she was from like the way it's spoken about in sources and stuff. I don't think she was neglected. I think it was just, she wanted more attention than what she was getting. But her parents had to split their attention between four children. So it just wasn't enough for Beverly as she was growing up. And when she joined primary school for the first time and she was like mingling with other kids her age, making friends, and they were talking about their mums and dads, that was when it kind of really hit home for Beverly about like how different her situation was to the other kids. They would talk about like all the things that they would do with their mum and dad on a weekend, all the places they would go, all the fun things they would do. And Beverly just couldn't relate because she just didn't spend as much time with her parents as other kids did. It made her feel really jealous and she subconsciously started to resent her parents for not 
being there for her the way that other kids' parents seem to be for their kids. As she grew up and became a teenager, Beverly Allett gained a significant amount of weight, which made her feel very insecure just in herself. Her confidence just went like that. And I think that was less to do with the way that she looked, but more to do with the bullying that came with this weight gain. You know what kids are like, they will pick on anyone for anything that makes them different. And for Beverly, that was her weight. Her weight was what made her different to all the other kids. The kids at school were just awful to her about her size and she felt so left out. She was always the butt of the joke. She was never like in on things with other people. She was never really treated as an equal to the other kids. She was always the one that everyone laughed at. So she'd gone from having no attention on her all her life to now having a lot of attention, but the bad kind, you know, it was negative attention that she was getting, it was bullying. All she ever wanted was for people to be nice to her and to spend time with her and, you know, to just, to just be friends with her positive kind of attention from her peers. That's all she ever wanted, but she just wasn't getting it. And so she came up with a plan on how she was gonna get this attention. She turned up to school one day with a bandage on and every time she passed someone in the hallway, they would see this bandage and be like, oh my God, like what happened? Are you okay? Is everything all right? You know, they would say like nice caring things about this injury that Beverly had. Little did they know she didn't have an injury. She'd just put that bandage on, on a non-existent wound for this exact reason. So that people would come up to her and, and care about her and ask her questions and give her attention. And clearly it worked. And so from this point on, Beverly started doing this a lot more often. She would do bandages, she would put plasters on. She even like made herself a fake cast which like, this is a child in primary school. So I don't know how she did that, but she did. But as time went by and Beverly keeps showing up to school with all these different bandages, plasters, it stops getting her the attention that it once did because people are just getting used to Beverly being injured at this point. She realized that in order to still get this attention that she once got, she was gonna have to step up these injuries. It wasn't enough to just have a bandage on her arm anymore. She needed to show people that she was hurt. And this is when Beverly Allett began self-harming. She would go home and break things like glasses or plates so that she could then use a shard of glass or a shard of this crockery and cut herself with it. So then she would be able to go into school and have these visible injuries on her that people could see and then people would care again. And it was around this time that she started becoming obsessed with anything medical. Obviously it started out with like the bandages and stuff, but now it was, it was becoming an obsession, just anything medical. She was obsessed with different medications, different treatments, different chemicals, all this kind of stuff. She loved learning about it. She loved hearing about it. And although it went undetected at the time, it's easy to see looking back that at this point in her life, Beverly Allett was developing Munchausen syndrome. Munchausen syndrome is a mental health condition in which the person will purposefully make themselves ill or harm themselves in some kind of way in order to get attention or sympathy. And the thing that separates Munchausen syndrome as a mental health condition with like other similar things, like people doing similar things, is that someone with Munchausen syndrome knows that they are doing it. They know that they are not sick, they know that they are not ill, but they want that attention so bad that they will fake it in order to get it. That's what separates that, like it being a condition rather than just being like odd behavior. They know that they're manipulating people. That is why they're doing it. It is a manipulation tactic as well as a mental health condition. And it can take many different forms. Of course, like Beverly, they can resort to physically harming themselves, like cutting themselves or using fake bandages to make it look like they've got an injury. Or people will do other things like tampering with medical equipment, like um, heating up a thermometer to make it look like they've got a fever. Some people will even poison themselves with like different medications so that they will actually get sick 
but they've done it to themselves for the attention. It can even be like faking psychological illnesses like depression or anxiety or like schizophrenia. People will fake hearing voices in their head, stuff like that. It can take so many different forms. And Beverly was still very, very young as she was developing this. And I think that's one of the reasons why it went so unnoticed because she'd just always been like that because she developed it so young. She was still in primary school. So she was like, what? 10 years old, possibly even younger when she starts faking these injuries, putting bandages on to go to school. But anyway, aside from all of that that was going on, Beverly did live a normal life, a normal childhood. In fact, her family was very nice, if you can say that. I know she didn't get enough attention growing up, but that was like, the only problem they had. She had nice parents, she had nice siblings. Like her parents really wanted all of their children to go to this prestigious grammar school in the area because it gave them the best chances in life. But this grammar school that they were all trying to get into after primary school, it was one of those where you have to take a test to be able to get in. There's an entry test. And if you don't pass that test, you don't go to that school. Beverly's older sister took that test. She passed it. She got into this prestigious grammar school. Her parents were so so chuffed, but then Beverly's turn came, she took the test and she failed. She didn't get into that grammar school that her parents wanted her to go to. And this really disappointed Beverly. Um, I don't think her parents like had an issue with this. Obviously they would have preferred for their children to go to a better school, but it wasn't the end of the world that Beverly was just gonna have to go to a normal school. But Beverly herself was just like really hard on herself about this. And I think it was the sum of a lot of different emotions in her life because Beverly had never been extraordinary at anything. She was always just a very average girl in her looks, in her intelligence, in her sporting ability, in her talents. You know, there was nothing that ever made her feel stand out. And I know that kind of sounds awful, me sitting here saying she was average in all of these different categories, but that's just what everyone said. She never really put the effort into any part of her life to be able to excel. And so she did, she was just always average at everything. And she always looked at her older sister who was above average at everything. Intelligence, sports, she was very popular in school, all this kind of stuff. And Beverly saw her sister as a version of herself that she could never be. And I think this rejection from her sister's school only made her feel even more inferior to her siblings. It was just perpetuating this attention-seeking cycle that Beverly Allett was stuck in. So anyway, Beverly starts her own secondary school, this other school, and as soon as she starts, she is always ill. She is always either off school or she's coming home from school early, for anything, she would have backache, neck ache, a sore throat, a cold, stomach ache, you name it, she had it at one point and she was off school for it. So she had very poor attendance for that exact reason. She was barely ever at school. And that mixed with the fact that at the best of times, she was not a very personable person. She was not very friendly or outgoing. She didn't put herself out there. And because she was barely in school anyway, this all stopped her from making friends. The other girls in Beverly's school apparently thought she was quite weird and they didn't want to involve her in different things. And so this made Beverly Allett's teenage years very, very lonely. Like she's not getting the attention from home. She's not getting the attention at school. She's just not really got anyone. And don't take that the wrong way. It's not like people didn't like her. It's just that she didn't have anyone close to her. But her parents loved her, her siblings loved her. She didn't have it bad, is what I'm trying to say. She just didn't have it great either. And everyone around her at this point, her friends, her family, any like anyone, teachers, they were all very unaware of her Munchausen syndrome. Everyone just believed her. Every time that she said she was ill, everyone always believed her. In fact, the only people that didn't believe her were doctors. But Beverly had a plan on how she was gonna get around this because every time she would go and see a doctor and they would doubt her, she would never go to that doctor again. So she was just constantly going to different doctors, telling them all these issues. And as soon as one of them would get suspicious, she'd leave. She didn't want to risk them exposing her lies 
because then that would push her even further away from the attention that she so craved. So already as a teenager, she is very crafty about this. She knows how to get what she wants. In fact, one of the maddest things that she ever faked with her Munchausen syndrome, she actually convinced the doctors that she had appendicitis and that she needed her appendix removing. I actually can't believe it got to surgery. Like she had her appendix taken out. Do they not do scans? Do they not like have a look at it before they removed it? Because actually the surgeon that removed it, as soon as he like took it out of her human body, he looked at it and he was like, why are we taking this out? This is not inflamed. It doesn't look like it should be causing Beverly problems. Like why are we here doing this surgery? It looks fine. She never had appendicitis, never. She'd somehow managed to fluke all these different appointments and scans. Well, did she ever have a scan? I don't know, but she managed to fluke them all and get herself all the way to the operating table. And she didn't even stop there. She was gonna try and milk this appendicitis thing for all it was worth because after the surgery, she would even, so like the wounds that she had from her incisions, she would pick at those wounds and intentionally try to halt the healing of them or even infect them, make them worse so that she would have to keep going back to the doctors to get like medication or to get them looked at, to get them cleaned up because it was just prolonging the attention that this appendicitis gave her. These wounds that should have taken probably a matter of weeks to heal actually ended up taking months because Beverly was juicing them for all they were worth. Ew, juicing them. Not literally juicing them, obviously, but like juicing all the attention that she could out of this. Anyway, when Beverly Allett finally finished high school, she actually left with very few qualifications overall. She got one O level, which is the equivalent of a modern day GCSE. That's like the qualification that you get at the end of high school in the UK. And that was in food and nutrition. So she got one O level in food and nutrition. And then she got a few CSEs, which is like a step below an O level, a step below a GCSE. It's kind of for people that are probably not gonna pass their GCSEs. So they put them through this kind of foundation level just so that they'll get at least something, you know? And she got four CSEs in English, maths, French, and biology. Whereas her older sister had passed all of her O-levels. She got every single qualification that she possibly could out of high school, whereas Beverly got one and like four halves. So she was still constantly comparing herself to her sister. She was constantly feeling inferior. And after leaving school, Beverly Alec couldn't really do much with the few qualifications that she did have. Like you do kind of need your O levels to be able to go on and get the good jobs. And so she, she needed some other kind of qualification to back her up in life. So she started looking into some special courses for people that have less qualifications for people that maybe only have CSEs and stuff like that. And that was when she found a vocational course to become a nurse. And because no one had really caught on to her Munchausen syndrome at this point, no one realized just how disastrous this career path could be and disastrous it was. So anyway, she enrolls herself on this nursing course. And at one point she actually ends up befriending an older woman that worked at the Grantham and Kesteven Hospital. And this woman acted as like a slight mentor for her. It wasn't full on, but like she was there for Beverly to ask questions and stuff whenever she needed. And this woman actually lent her a bunch of textbooks, her old textbooks about like nursing theory and medicine and all these different things. So Beverly was studying for her nursing course and at the same time she actually picked up a part-time job at her local pub and it was at this pub in this job where she actually started to develop socially a, a lot actually. She was finally forced to learn some people skills. Up until this point she hadn't really been like pushed in the deep end like that but when you're doing a social job literally pouring pints you need to be able to hold a conversation with the customer. She ended up befriending a lot of the regulars that would come in the pub often. A lot of them were like middle-aged men and they loved Beverly. She was like one of their favorite um, bartenders. They thought she was attractive and she would always tell them all these like fun, interesting stories. And it actually earned her the nickname, The Fable, because a fable is like a fictional tale 
And the men could always tell that she was lying about these stories. She always had the most crazy, most interesting stories, which were obviously lies, but none of the men ever like called her out on it too much. It was just kind of a joking, like underlying thing that she was always lying in these stories. Everyone knew that, but no one ever really like, do you know what I'm trying to say? It was never an issue, but like they all knew she was lying, but they were such like little random stories that it didn't really matter. But yeah, like I said, a lot of the men were attracted to Beverly and this was like the first time in her life that she was ever getting male attention in this way. It wasn't just like middle-aged men that were attracted to her, by the way. There were boys her age that would come in the pub and she actually got talking to a lot of the boys her age and she ended up dating a few of them. She got into her first ever relationship when she was like 17, 18, and it didn't last very long. She was in like a string of different short term relationships until she met a man named Stephen Briggs when she was 19 years old. He was the first one of these boyfriends to stick around longer than like a month or two. And actually he was with her for a full year and then he proposed. So the two of them were gonna be married. Unfortunately though, not long after the two of them got engaged, their relationship turned sour and Stephen actually ended up leaving Beverly. And he was very vocal about this at the pub because he would still go in that local pub and everyone knew Beverly there. And he did not shy away from telling everyone there that it was all Beverly's fault that they'd split up. Because Beverly Allett was supposedly a, a rather abusive partner, physically and emotionally. She would hit him, she would manipulate him. She was very aggressive, very violent, and also very deceptive. She would lie to him all the time. And actually that was the thing that made him leave her. Not the physical abuse, not the emotional abuse. It was the lying. Because it got to a point where Stephen was just like, I don't know what is real and what is not in my relationship, in my whole life. He didn't know who the real Beverly was. He didn't know what their relationship was. He just like, it was really messing up his head. And it was that that actually made him leave her. But in fact, the one lie that was the final straw in this relationship was when Beverly Allett lied to Stephen Briggs that she'd been raped. And she even said that she was pregnant with her rapist's baby. Of course, it didn't take long for Steve to find out that this was all a lie and that was it for him. He could not stay with a woman that was, that could lie about something like that. So Beverly is now about 20 years old. She's single again. She's still in this nursing course. And actually it's no surprise that being in the medical field, being around, you know, other nurses, trainee nurses, it was all making her Munchausen syndrome a million times worse. She was actually training on site at a hospital. So she was working in a hospital day in, day out. And for the first year of her course, she had 160 sick days. Just to put that into perspective, that is the equivalent of one and a half days a week every week or six days every month. That is an insanely high absence rate. And she was sick like off work for things like a sore throat or a cold or like backache, you know, things that a lot of people would just work through. At first it was fine, you know, people believed her, but then after, you know, a hundred sick days, people were starting to doubt the authenticity of this. And in fact, a few of her coworkers caught her a few times trying to fake a high temperature on a thermometer. She would boil water in the kettle and then put it in her mouth. Like when it's nearly still boiling, she would have been like hurting herself for this. And then she would put the thermometer in. So then the temperature would go whoosh and she'd look like she had a fever. But Beverly wasn't just doing all of this like just to get out of work. I think that's what her course thought. They thought that she was just faking sick because she couldn't be bothered like doing her work. But actually this was just who Beverly was at this point. Like all of these fake illnesses and stuff that she would have, she would go to the doctors for it as well because it was all about attention and sympathy. It wasn't to get out of doing things that she didn't want to do. It was because she wanted people to like ask how she was and stuff like that. So she would go to the doctor 160 times a year 
with like fake illnesses. In 1990, the year 1990 alone, Beverly Allett visited the doctors over 50 times. That works out at like nearly one a week. If you were Beverly's doctor, you would be sick of seeing that face. So anyway, when Beverly Allett was 20 years old, she graduated her nursing course and she was offered to stay on at that hospital and she was given like just another trainee nurse like just another further training position so she wasn't like fully qualified she didn't have a job there yet she was just going on to like the next stage and in this next stage all of the trainee nurses got to live together in dormitories on the hospital grounds so beverly was about to move in with a bunch of other nurses and this ended up going probably even worse than what you're imagining in your head right now because as soon as beverly allett moved into these dormitories a lot of weird unexplained things started happening. Curtains were set on fire, smoke alarms were set off for no reason, locks in the doors were filled with super glue so that no one could get in or out. But one of the worst things that happened by far in these dormitories was one day, one of the nurses actually came back from a really long shift that she'd been working. She went and put the oven on to go and make herself some dinner. And all of a sudden the room, as this oven heated up, the room filled with the smell of human feces. And when this nurse went and took a look inside that oven, there was human feces smeared all over the inside of it. And not just the oven, it was in the fridge, it was on the walls, human feces smeared all over the dormitories. It was actually horrifying. And everyone suspected Beverly of this. Of course, it all started happening as soon as she moved in. People were already suspicious of her just in general with like all the time that she would have off of work. People just didn't, you know, her coworkers just didn't really like her or respect her because she seemed like a weird, <laughs> a weird nurse. But yeah, she moved into the dormitories and it just so happened that in the same week, all this weird unexplained shit starts happening. Annoyingly though, Beverly Allett was never caught in the act and there were no cameras in the dormitories. This is like the 1990s, so security cameras weren't everywhere at the time. Um, so whenever anyone accused her, she could just deny it and be like, no, I wasn't even there when, when that happened. But everyone knew she was. Everyone knew she was, like she was always home whenever these weird things would happen in the dormitories. These weird things would never happen when she was out on shift. So yeah, everyone kind of knew it was Beverly, but no one could really prove it. And it actually got so bad that the hospital had to put out a statement to all of these nurses saying, if these weird things don't stop happening, we're gonna have to kick you all out. We're, we're gonna have to take you all off this training program, kick you out of the dormitories because we can't be facilitating this. So yeah, the hospital threatened to remove them all from the course if these things didn't stop. And what do you know? They stopped immediately, actually. Nothing ever happened again after that. And they never officially figured out who it was. So no one was ever punished. But you know, everyone always thought or knew it was Beverly Allett. But anyway, now that she is literally living on hospital grounds, her Munchausen syndrome gets even worse. It's just progressively getting worse and worse and worse through her whole life. And one of her most dangerous stunts that she did as she was working in that hospital, because bear in mind, now she's got access to loads of medical equipment, which for someone with Munchausen syndrome, that is terrifying. And she took full advantage of this. Her most dangerous stunt was when she went and filled a syringe with water and then injected one of her breasts with this water, making it comically larger than the other one. And then she was going up to all her friends being like, oh my God, I'm so worried about my, my large breast. And all her friends were just like looking at her and they just did not know what to say at this point because they knew she'd done it to herself. No one had seen her do it, but like they just knew. And like, what do you say to that? They were just baffled with how unprofessional and dangerous this woman was on the job but no one ever really said anything to her because no one ever wants to be that coworker that's got a problem with another coworker. You know what I mean? It's just uncomfortable. So no one ever said anything, but they definitely should have. Nurses did, however, start to distance themselves from Beverly Allett. They never like told her off or like got her into trouble, 
but they didn't want to be a friend. They started leaving her out. They started going for lunch without her. And once again, Beverly found herself very lonely in life. She was stuck in this cycle all her life of not getting enough attention. So she'd do all this crazy weird stuff in order to get attention, but that would just end up pushing people even further away because now they think she's really weird for doing those things. She just made it so much harder for herself to be able to make friends because she just, kept putting people off her. So anyway, by the end of her further training course, the course that she was on at the moment, she was actually the only nurse out of all of them that wasn't offered a permanent position at that hospital. She was the only one. The main reason being her attendance. She'd had so much time off that the hospital just didn't see her as a reliable staff member. They couldn't count on her to be a good nurse. And also because she'd had so much time off, that meant she'd missed so much of her training that she just wasn't that good of a nurse. Like obviously if everyone else is practicing day in, day out, learning day in, day out, but you're taking 160 days off a year, you're not gonna know as much as the rest of the people on your course. So they wanted to give all these women jobs, but they just couldn't, they just couldn't give one to Beverly. Instead, because the hospital did see potential in her, you know, she'd done all this different training through the years and they wanted to be able to give her a job, but they couldn't right now. So in the meantime, they decided to give her a six month temporary contract on the children's ward because the children's ward at Grantham Hospital anyway was deemed the more like easy ward to work on because the children's ward at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital was very small compared to normal children's wards and they didn't deal with very severe things. They only dealt with like broken bones or infections and stuff like that. If it was anything worse that needed like more serious attention, they would just refer the child to a different hospital. Normally Nottingham hospital, they would send the kid to. So yeah, these were all kind of less serious, easier things to treat. And they were confident that Beverly could do these things. But to be honest, I don't think they would have even given her this six month temporary job on the children's ward had that hospital not been so terribly understaffed. They were so desperate for any nurse that they were willing to give a job to this woman that they know is not a good nurse, but they just didn't have enough people working at the hospital that, you know, they had to take on anyone that they could get. They hoped that putting her on this six month temporary contract would give her enough time to build up her skills, build up, you know, her confidence in this job that by the end of this six months, they could review it and maybe give her a more permanent position in a different wing of the hospital. So, She's now working on the children's ward and the shift pattern on the children's ward was there would be two fully trained, fully qualified nurses on during the day and one during the night. And these fully trained qualified nurses would be supported by trainee nurses. I think there was usually about two or three on each shift and Beverly was always one of these like trainee girls. And the children's ward at Grantham Hospital was a really, really nice ward to work on from what I read. They were a very like, because it was a very small ward, all of the nurses that worked there were very, very close. It was like a little tight knit family, they called themselves. And they were more than welcoming to Beverly Allett. They were very excited to have her in the, the children's ward family. So Beverly Allett's first shift was on February 18th, 1991. She was 22 years old when she started this job and she was very, bright and eager to learn. She was very excited to be in this position. And actually she came just at the right time because this was about to be one of the busiest periods that the children's ward ever had. Nurses actually described this as their busiest winter yet because so many kids were falling ill with, you know, very typical winter illnesses like colds, flus, viruses, chest infections, but there was just such a huge number of them that the hospital really needed this extra pair of hands. And that actually brings us to one of Beverly's first ever patients, a seven week old baby named Liam James Taylor. Liam had a really nasty chest infection that ended up developing into pneumonia, which is why he had to be hospitalized, sent to the Grantham Children's Ward. And his parents were so worried. I think as any parent would be in that situation, they were losing sleep, they were so stressed, 
stressed they could barely eat. And Nurse Beverly Allett sat them down and she reassured them that their son was in good hands, they were gonna do everything they could to help him. And in fact, she actually suggested that they go home and get some rest because their son was in good care now. And his parents were just so grateful for all the help from the staff. And so, yeah, they went home, they rested, they, you know, got some sleep for the first time in days. However, when they returned to the hospital the next morning, they were greeted with some bad news that Liam had actually taken a turn for the worse during the night. At one point, he'd actually stopped breathing completely. He had some sort of respiratory attack and they managed to bring him round. They managed to resuscitate him and he was breathing again now the next morning, but they wanted to keep an eye on him because they didn't know where this attack had come from, why it had happened, and they wanted to make sure that another one wasn't gonna happen as well. So he was gonna be kept in for a second night now and Nurse Beverly Allett wasn't actually supposed to be working that second night, but she actually volunteered to go in and work that shift unpaid just so that she could look after Liam Taylor. And everyone was so grateful for her offering this, the hospital, because they were so understaffed, they really needed that extra pair of hands. And of course, Liam's parents, they thanked Beverly Allett so many times because that was such dedication to their son. So yeah, he's staying in for another night, but just before midnight that night, he had a second respiratory attack. He stopped breathing again. They managed to resuscitate him, but this time he didn't bounce back quite as well as he did the first time. The first time he pretty much fully recovered, whereas this time he was very weak. And then within a few hours of his last attack, Liam had a third respiratory attack. He stopped breathing for a third time in what, like 24 hours? Obviously at this point, he was hooked up to all these different machines and monitors that were checking his heart rate and his breathing and stuff like that. And if he was to stop breathing, these monitors are all supposed to go off, sound alarms to alert the staff who can come in and help him. But this third time that he stopped breathing, the monitors didn't go off. They didn't alert to him stopping breathing. It was actually Beverly Allett that noticed that he'd stopped breathing. She went into his little hospital room and she saw him laid there in the bed. He was so pale, his lips were blue. He had like red splotches all over his face. It turned out that Liam Taylor had suffered a huge cardiac arrest. This is a seven week old baby and during this cardiac arrest, his heart just completely stopped and his brain was starved of oxygen for so long that it meant that he would be permanently disabled and brain dead following this attack. Doctors put Liam Taylor on a life support machine and they contacted his parents who rushed straight to the hospital. But as soon as they were informed just how severe their son's condition was, his parents made the decision to take him off of life support. Liam James Taylor died in his parents' arms at just seven weeks old. His recorded cause of death was cardiac arrest. In a little message on his gravestone, Liam's parents refer to him as Pudding Pants, which was like a cute little nickname that they'd given him in the short yet sweet time that they'd had with him. And following this, the hospital were just devastated that something like this had happened, that they'd lost a child like this. And you know, it is all part of the job, you know, not every case can be a miracle case where you save someone's life. You know, in this industry, you do watch people die and it's heartbreaking every single time. Yet these nurses knew that they had a job to do for all the other children on that ward. And so they picked themselves up and they got back to work. Little did they know that the death of Liam Taylor would be the start of a string of unexpected child deaths there at Grantham Hospital. Two weeks later, on March 5th, 1991, 11 year old Timothy Hardwick was admitted to the children's ward. Timothy had cerebral palsy and he suffered epileptic fits, one of which had actually been so severe while he was at school that his school had to phone for an ambulance, which then transported him to Grantham Hospital. He was originally only supposed to be kept in for one night just because of this severe epileptic fit and they just wanted to keep an eye on him. They just wanted to make sure that he recovered properly after the fit. However, the longer he spent in hospital, it seemed the worse he was getting. And then later that night, just as Liam Taylor had done two weeks prior, 
Timothy Hardwick went into cardiac arrest and he stopped breathing. A huge team of doctors rushed to his bedside and they did absolutely everything in their power to resuscitate him, but they just couldn't save him. And so at 6.15 p.m. that night, 11-year-old Timothy Hardwick was pronounced dead, just hours after arriving at the hospital. His death was so unexpected. I mean, Liam Taylor's had been as well, but Timothy was literally only there just for observations. They really thought that he was gonna be fine to go home the next morning. They were literally just watching him to make sure he was fine. They never expected to lose him. So for that exact reason, an autopsy was carried out on Timothy Hardwick because they wanted to figure out how he'd just randomly gone into cardiac arrest and died. But during this autopsy, pathologists just could not figure out his cause of death. There was nothing unusual, nothing out of the ordinary. They just, they genuinely did not know. And so for that reason, they just assumed that his cause of death had been something to do with his epilepsy and it was recorded as such. Following his death, Timothy's mother wrote a poem for him that I believe was read at his funeral and I have it here for you now. Oh Timothy, my special boy, how I'd love to see you more. To see you laugh and walk and talk perhaps. Is that too much for a mum to ask? My heart cries out for you, my lad, and so does the heart of your poor dad. In Grantham Hospital at the same time as Timothy Hardwick was a 15 month old baby named Kaylee Desmond. She'd been admitted about a week prior with quite a nasty chest infection and so they were keeping a close eye on her and it seemed that she was recovering quite well and that she was gonna be able to go home soon. So doctors started signing all these discharge forms. They were really getting ready to say goodbye to her and let her go home. Nurse Beverly Allett went in and she was helping her prepare all the things. And as she did, Kaylee Desmond went into cardiac arrest twice. Both times she was able to be resuscitated, but because this had happened twice in such a short space of time, Grantham and Kesteven Hospital didn't feel equipped to take care of this girl, and so they very quickly transferred her to Nottingham Hospital for monitoring there. This is a baby, just over a year old, and she's just had two cardiac arrests in, what, like an hour? Less than an hour? So they were really, really worried about her at this point in time. She got to Nottingham Hospital, and they carried out a thorough physical examination of her. This was an otherwise healthy child. I mean, yes, she did have a chest infection, but she was pretty much at the end of that. She was pretty much recovered. So how and why could she have possibly gone into cardiac arrest twice in an hour? out of nowhere. So yeah, like I said, they carried out this physical examination to see if they could find anything wrong with her and they couldn't, there was really nothing. I mean, there was one note on the file. They'd found like a puncture mark and an air bubble in her armpit, but they just kind of put that down to like an accidental injection or something from the other hospital. It didn't seem like it had caused cardiac arrest anyway. Following her ordeal, Kaylee Desmond was actually left permanently disabled because her brain had been starved of oxygen for so long. Doctors initially told her parents that she would never be able to walk again, she would never be able to talk again, and you'll be happy to hear that she's actually proved them wrong on both counts. But yeah, eventually Kaylee was released from Nottingham Hospital. She didn't go into cardiac cardiac arrest again. They had no idea why she had twice in a row, but she never did ever again, so. But anyway, back to the Grantham and Kesteven Hospital. Just two weeks after the last child death, a five month old boy named Paul Crampton was admitted to the children's ward. And this was purely a precaution. Just like Timothy Hardwick had been, he had this bad epileptic fit, but they just wanted him in hospital just to care for him. Paul Crampton was kind of the same in that he'd had a really bad chest infection, but it was on its way out. But he was wheezing really badly and they just wanted to keep an eye on his breathing and stuff. So he was in hospital maybe for a couple of days. It was literally just to be on the safe side. They really thought that he was fine and he'd pretty much recovered and that he was probably gonna go home within the next couple of days. But within hours of this five month old baby arriving at the hospital, his parents got a call in the early hours of the morning telling them to get to the hospital ASAP because their son had taken a turn for the worse. Paul Crampton had gone into sudden cardiac arrest just like all those other children had and doctors rushed to his bedside and they managed to resuscitate him, they managed to get him back but again, they couldn't figure out how and why this had happened. So yeah, they're doing all these exams, all these tests on him to try and figure it out. 
and then within a few hours of the last one, he goes into cardiac arrest again, a second time. Again, they managed to resuscitate him, but this time he's just so weak. He's gone pale, his lips are blue, red splotches on his face, just like the other boy. They treated him with glucose, which actually helped to perk him up completely because a lot of cardiac arrests are all cardiac arrests. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but a lot of them are caused by like hypoglycemia, which is not enough glucose in your body. I think, but they treated him with glucose and it worked. And actually once they gave him this glucose, he bounced back to pretty much a completely healthy, happy baby. And doctors were just so confused how he had suddenly gone into cardiac arrest and then suddenly snapped out of it as soon as they gave him this glucose. None of this seemed natural. But yeah, like I said, they were just so confused at how this young boy had just suddenly gone into cardiac arrest. And so they decided to keep him on the ward again for a few more days so that they could monitor him. And he was recovering well, seemed like he was gonna be going home soon. So the nurses start getting him ready to leave, doctors are signing the discharge forms, all that kind of stuff. And his parents decided to go down to the hospital cafe for some lunch while they were getting their son sorted. However, when they returned to the children's ward, all the nurses were running around panicking. It turned out that Paul Crampton had gone into cardiac arrest for a third time. And now the nurses at the Grantham Hospital just could not deal with this. Like I said, it was a small ward, understaffed. They don't deal with severe cases. And so straight away, they wanted to transport Paul to Nottingham Hospital where they were a lot better equipped to deal with it. I think they'd managed to resuscitate him by now from this third cardiac arrest. And so they put this five month old baby in the back of an ambulance to transport him to Nottingham Hospital. And nurse Beverly Allett, you know, the angel that she was, she offered to go free of charge, volunteer her time to sit in the back of that ambulance with this baby to make sure that he got to the next hospital safe. And everyone again was so grateful for her doing this. So yeah, anyway, Paul Crampton reaches Nottingham Hospital and they are just so confused at all these different cases they're getting from the Grantham Hospital. They're just seemingly very healthy, young, very young babies that just keep having cardiac arrests out of nowhere. And so this time they really wanted to test this boy and see what was going on. They did physical exams, blood tests, all different kinds of analysis, tests, swabs, everything. Also at the Nottingham Hospital, they treated him with glucose, just like they had at Grantham. And again, he perked up completely, which was weird. Like that people can perk up from sudden cardiac arrest a third in like the space of a few days and just be completely back to their normal selves. That doesn't happen. So they took all these samples, sent them off to the lab for analysis. And when they got the results back, doctors could not believe their eyes. Paul Crampton's blood insulin level was at 500. And just for context, the level of a child his age should be anywhere between 10 and 15. His was 500. Doctors just knew that this was not natural, especially because he'd gone into cardiac arrest so suddenly and recovered so suddenly. Nothing about this was natural. And so they put this really mad insulin result down to two possible reasons. The first reason could have been faulty equipment, faulty, you know, testers, something. It could have been just like an anomaly fluke result because sometimes, that happens. Sometimes you do get false results. That's why they do multiple tests of things to make sure that it's not an anomaly, but like here they only had one. Or option number two that doctors put this down to and the one that they believed more so was that Paul Crampton was suffering with an insulinoma. An insulinoma is basically a little tumor in the pancreas that releases a lot of insulin all in one go causing an attack like this and they couldn't find this insulinoma on his pancreas because they did look for it, thinking that this was the cause, and there wasn't one there. So they thought, well, maybe it had like released all this insulin and then fixed itself, it had like gotten rid of itself. That was the only explanation that they could think of anyway. There was no proof that there ever was an insulinoma, but like that's all they could think could have happened. And so they kept Paul Crampton in the Nottingham hospital for a few more days, checked him over and, he was fine. He recovered really well, actually. Rather quickly, five month old Paul Crampton was discharged from the hospital and he never suffered a cardiac arrest or a respiratory attack or any kind of insulin related problems ever again. For the rest of his life, he never had another problem like that. He was lucky to survive this medical anomaly. 
However, other children from the Grantham Hospital wouldn't be so lucky. And we'll talk about the rest of those cases in part two. Thank you so, so much for watching this one. Make sure that you're subscribed with notifications on so that you don't miss when part two is uploaded. Thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can get a one month free trial when you sign up using the link down below in the description. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now so thank you so much if you want to become a channel member you can click the join button down below but yeah thank you so so much for watching this video remember subscribe part two is coming soon leave a thumbs up on this video if you did enjoy it and if you want to watch another one in the meantime i'll link you a video right here or if you want to subscribe to my channel you can click this circle right here because i post videos like this all the time okay bye